One of the most famous books in economics is The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. So I've taken that title for this paper on purpose, as we mentioned. Um, one other thing, some of you have heard this lecture in broad terms before, so uh, I apologise. I tried to convince myself that maybe when you hear it a second time you grasp it even better. Um, but there is nothing new or nothing exciting for Connor to report on Drive Timer, anything like that. It's, uh, it's going to be quite deadpan, but uh, anyway, I'll have a shot at it. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on the role of the state, and I'm, the definition of arts I'm using is the core that David looked at, the inner core, and then the slightly outer core. That's really what I mean by the arts for this debate. So as Connor said, really one of my main themes is we, you're, you're going down, we're going down a dead alley if you talk about the employment benefits of the arts. Uh, it's important to point it out that there are employment benefits, but we ha you can never lose sight of emphasising these broader wealth. And wealth is not monetary wealth, it's wealth in, in, if you look up the definition of it, it's a much broader concept. So what I want to draw attention to is five things. There's a slightly different classification to David's, but we're, we're ending up saying the same thing. One is to do with national and regional identity and the, arts, the role of the arts. Then connected to that you, uh, is social cohesion. In a sense, national identity matters because it creates social cohesion, and social cohesion is fundamental to the operation of an economy or any society. So, and then national prestige, which is slightly different. National prestige uh, is, uh, can lead to social cohesion. Then as David talked about experimental innovative work, um, that a lot of work can go in the subsidised sector that benefits the wider economy. Uh, he also talked about option demand for future generations, which affects the built heritage and museums and libraries. And then the economic spin-offs. So I'm going to dismiss the direct employment benefits, but there are other important spin-offs, uh, economic spin-offs, which are important to emphasise. So the first is, uh, as you see here, the wealth benefit. Um, and the argument is simple. And the President uh, Higgins has been making this argument quite a bit of late. Uh, it's linked to the national identity and the social cohesion. Uh, and I think it's, it's good that, that argument has been made. So the argument is, if it contributes to national identity, and national identity benefits all of us, therefore all of us should pay for it through taxation. The argument is uh, almost trivially simple. I just want, to, before I come to that, and it's linked to social cohesion, I mean, the concept of national identity has been criticised uh, very severely, especially in the US. So uh, it can be divisive and exclusive. So whatever we're talking about in Ireland, it must be an inclusive form of identity. But we're much smaller. We're just like a small region of a much bigger economy. But again, just that this is a much debated topic. The other point that's often made is, OK, if it does contribute to national identity, so what? Uh, you know, sports contribute to national identi identity, media, uh, religion, language, and so on. So again, this is from a, 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 a Canadian economist. And again, just to make this point, of course they do. Uh, but arts, the arts do as well. Uh, just to say that others uh, do does not mean that arts does not contribute. And the main argument then is linking to public funding is that if national identity makes us feel uh, a sense of a nation and cohesiveness, which I'll mention in a sec, that in a, in a turn is a wealth benefit because you see some societies around the world they're not functioning simply because they don't have social cohesiveness. And that's part of the problem in Greece at the moment. There isn't social cohesiveness. And, and if that breaks down in society, the economy collapses as well. Uh, so it's a very strong argument uh, for uh, public funding. And the arts can unquestionably play a role in, in this. Now, I'm going to talk, David, David talked about the measurement difficulties. You know, we can set out the arguments, but they're almost impossible to measure. But a point I would make is that's true of almost every economic area. Da David mentioned motorways uh, as relatively straightforward. In fact, I point out in lectures that it's not, because the main benefit from motorways is the saving of lives. And it's almost impossible to put a value on the saving of lives. So it's not just in the arts. So, but the, just because there's difficulty of measurement doesn't mean the strong arguments cannot be put. And of course, you acknowledge that the other areas contribute to national identity as well. It's not exclusive to the arts. Um, the second argument is social cohesion, which is really part of the first. And uh, this, this very nice quote from um, Vale, who, who wrote so elegantly about the arts. But this is what we're talking about, it, that uh, the arts bind society and transmits its belief and standards. And as we see here, this social glue, which I've just been talking about, is essential, as I've said, to the functioning of a society. And that's the point uh, he's making. But what Vale, the point he made was that it, it also applies 
to media and particularly concentrated on religion and the commercial arts. So it's not exclusive again. Uh, so even though he's one of the greatest supporters of this argument, he was in a sense arguing against state arts uh, in the same argument. Um, can I just talk about national prestige? Because I have to stick to this, the 15 minutes, so I'm going to go fast. National prestige is a slightly different uh, argument to national identity. We may feel proud as a nation, but that we've actually no social cohesion. Uh, the national prestige starts from, just like an individual, as we'll see, an individual, wealthy individuals buy works of art because it gives them prestige in the world. And in a sense, the nation, nation can do the same. Um, so we have this quote from the people who started, basically, uh, I think, was David would agree, the literature on this, you know, that no country wants to be known as a wasteland. And the loss of sense of national prestige resulting from that is, is a reason for... Uh, the, the argument they quoted was getting a man on the moon in the US, that the, there was a massive national prestige argument in getting a man on the moon uh, more than anything else. And they li likened it then to the arts. So as I've said already, a nation, just like wealthy individuals, can support the arts because it reflects well on them as a society or as a nation. Um, but that applies, if we do well in the Euro uh, 2012, of course, there will be national prestige. Or we're all very proud of our golfers, our, um, our horse racing. So it's not exclusive to the arts, but it is part of this. You can feel proud about your arts uh, achievements, you can feel proud people winning Oscars in the arts and so on. So this contributes to this sense of national prestige. But the point I'm making there is national prestige is not a desirable in itself, necessarily. I mean, and it can evaporate. So it's not necessarily linked to identity. So if we do very well in Euro 2012, what has that got to do with Irish identity? It has something to do with national prestige. Uh, but unless they can be linked back to identity and therefore to more social cohesion, in my opinion, the, the key argument collapses. But it is linked to social cohesion, uh, I would argue, uh, national prestige. And our national prestige, especially in relation to the arts, arises primarily from the very Irishness of what we produce. So you can take, um, so for example, the, the key to our tourism success, as we'll argue later, is to do with identifiably Irish projects. Likewise, the key to our success in literature is to do what I, the prestige and then the identity. The two are linked. Very often prestige is linked to the very fact that it's so Irish in its identity. Um, and I've just said here again, uh, this does not necessarily imply a role for the state. So we just can't jump from saying uh, it creates a national prestige to say the state should be involved. That is, that's a, a jump that's not justified, I think. That's Wealth Benefit 2. Wealth Benefit 3 is different. So I, I would argue, and as I said already, you've heard, a lot of you have heard this before, uh, the, the third benefit is, and was alluded to in the discussion earlier, that the arts has a polar opposite role as well. And I would consider this to be part of the research and development function of the arts. And again, Dale brought out this very clearly, that the, uh, the role of the arts is not just to create social cohesion, but also actually to challenge the very basis of society. And it's, uh, and it's interesting, I have, I'm just refereeing a paper at the moment, I hope the person isn't here, um, criticising the arts community in Ireland for not being critical enough in the boom times and in questioning the whole basis, the materialism of the boom years. So I think that's interesting. This paper saw it as a role of the arts to actually question and maybe have foreseen the difficulties were coming down from an overemphasis on materialism. But that, again, is, uh, as I said, is part of a general research and development function. It's meant to break new ground. It's meant to uh, challenge with new ideas. And David has already mentioned these. So, for example, going on from that, its critical role in, in an agent provocateur of society. It's, as I said, that's, it's part of the much broader brief. So, for example, commercial and TV film uh, benefits hugely from live drama. Uh, I had to do a study on the subsidised theatre in Britain once, and I remember going to the commercial theatres. They were stronger in favour of subsidies than the subsidised sector was, because they realised that the, an awful lot of the experimental work is done in the subsidised theatre that eventually gets onto West End, maybe one in 20 of them. Uh, so they recognised that spin-off benefit that David talked about. Likewise, concert halls and theatres, orchestras and drama groups, they're the laboratories for composers and playwrights. And we were talking about this at lunch yesterday. I mean, in the university, we get funded for our research. And we're lucky if one in 20 of them actually 
leads to fruition. So it should be the same in the arts world. A lot of innovative work will fail. That's the nature of innovative work. But unless you have that uh, bed of innovative work, then the commercial arts will not prosper. And these are the concentric circles that was talking, uh, David was talking about. They're also a testing ground for new performing talent. So again, uh, 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 I can't remember the name of Mackenzie. He was one of the big entrepreneurs. He was arguing this, that it's not just a test bed for dr drama. It's a test bed for, for talent as well. Uh, that they don't have to incur the expense, uh, j just like we said in, in pure research. And what I don't have here is also a test ground for, I mean, I, mean, I always remember the story, I was looking at um, Apple and um, BMW. And one of the big success stories, uh, as I understand it, I, I, I talked to the person from Apple, is their design. And he said the, the key success of BMW is not the engines of the car, but their design. And then again, this is, as David was talking about, this is the feed in from the core out to the uh, industries. And again, that's a spin off. Uh, so the experimental, innovative part of the art, I think, it could be pushed much stronger by the sector. So what if nobody turns up at a, a theatre uh, if it's experimental drama? That's the whole nature of experimental work. It's not to have bums and seats, to use that awful expression, but it's actually to break integrative ground that may be uh, commercially a success at some stage. The fourth benefit David has talked about, it really relates much more to the built heritage and museums, which is a very big part of the Irish cultural sector. Um, and we'll see later it links to the economic spillover benefits. And the argument here is it's a bit like the, the three um, existence and option demand that David talked about, but in particular in relation to later generations. You know, once it's destroyed, if we don't hold on to the built heritage, then it will not be available for future generations. And we may be prepared to pay for it. So even though we don't go near any of these at the moment, we may be prepared to pay. So the same happens at an individual level. I'm very reluctant to throw out anything that might be of interest to the family down the road, because I've looked at the family, my mother's history going back to 1690, and I wish people had kept more things. But it's the same thing with a nation, that you want to preserve, and even though you don't find use for it now, somebody may down the line. The point I would make, though, is what is the benefit to future generations from having a national monarch preserved? And it comes back to the national identity. These identify who we are. So unless you can actually say to future, so this I would argue, national identity and national distinctiveness is really, in my opinion, the fundamental argument. So preserving a national museum uh, that we don't value now, or a national monument, links fundamentally to this. Um, and going back again, national identity and national cohesiveness is a public wealth benefit. We all benefit, including the functioning of the economy, and therefore there should be significant funding by the state. Um, the economic spillover, so I'm not dismissing these, but th uh, they're important. And I think it's, uh, actually, th I'm trying to convince myself that it's useful that you've got two different approaches uh, to the material today. So I always try to justify the things after the event, but David has come at it from a different angle, which sometimes can uh, tell students, if you read two different textbooks, come, th if they come at it from a different background, it actually helps you, helps you understand uh, the material. So I'm coming at it just from a slightly different background. So the first argument is that state money is devoted to employment, Enterprise Ireland. Uh, why not to the arts as well? So it's part of, of employment policy, and we talked about that uh, yesterday. The main point I would make is direct employment is not special. If you put a billion euro into any activity, hairdressing or whatever, it's great direct employment. So it's, it's almost a meaningless argument, although you, you have to identify that there is that direct employment. But there are economic spillover benefits that the sector can emphasize. And the biggest one in an Irish context is that it's a tourist attraction. So it may be the magnet that attracts tourists into an area. So we, we've heard a uh, very glowing mention of Temple Bar, which I endorsed this morning from several speakers. But there's literary trails and heritage, and that's documented very well. And there is a tourism budget as well, so the arts sector can tap into that. But it's wider than that. It's again going back to one of David's points. It's a contributor to creative city. I know Florida, some people like his work, others hate it. But it, it, it's, it's this notion that creative people actually attract other workers into the city. And the creative city concept, although it's hard to pin down what it is. The counter argument, of course, is, well, sports facilities. Lots of people come to Ireland to play golf. Um, they go for nature trails. Uh, they come for the good pubs and restaurants. So you'll have people arguing. People are coming to Temple Bar because there's very good pubs and restaurants rather than the other way around. And it's just to acknowledge that argument. I always believe in argument is to know what the others are going to say and answer it before they make the point without you addressing it first. Um, 
But I think also um, it's, it's not just the state art sector. I mean, the commercial art sector, so the West End in London attracts is a huge tourist attraction, which is in the commercial art sector. Temple Bar, rock concerts, and traditional music concerts, which are a cross really between the two. Um, just to finish on this, I know I'm just run, I'm running sli slightly over. Um, I think the point I would make is that some of these activities, so you can play golf anywhere. I don't play golf, but, but I gather Bally Bunyan is different to any other golf course in the world. Uh, but I'm not sure at the end of the day you're just looking at the ball all the time. Um, but uh, I think it, it, in relation to the arts, though, you could say it has, it, it's a product that's going to last. Uh, it's, there's a distinctiveness and an Irishness. So it goes back to the national identity. So some people come just back from a music festival in Sligo built around Yeats, and it really is an extraordinary experience and the way they've used Yeats there as a, as a tourist attraction. So you could say that's unique and cannot be reproduced anywhere else. So I would make the argument that the tourism aspect is important. And finally I make the point is there's not necessarily any conflict. You're not uh, prostituting your cultural heritage, in my opinion, in attracting tourists. It's, it's because what attracts tourists, in my opinion, is the very distinctiveness uh, a distinctive character, Irish character of the tourism product that the state is uh, trying to promote. So a couple of concluding comments. Um, David has mentioned this, we have to distinguish between public and private benefits and the public benefits should unambiguously be financed out of state monies. Um, so what I've tried to emphasise was these wider public benefits. David talked about the non-economic value and the cultural value, it's the same thing in a sense. And, but what I've tried to emphasise, I think, is the national identity and distinctive Irishness that the arts can contribute to. Um, the next point I make here is, we all know these benefits exist. Uh, the difficulty is, can we actually put a value on them? And we can't. No matter how many indicators we come up with, I, I did work for the English Arts Council, you, they were ending up with 45 different indicators. You then have to aggregate them to say something. But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be the strength of the argument. And I'm, not, I'm sure the arts community are tired, but every sector, the education sector, you have to keep repeating these arguments. So I think at the end of the day, it's relying on the force of the argument and the spirit. I remember I was on radio arts program with somebody recently, I won't mention it, but I was so impressed just by the sheer force and enthusiasm of the, article, of the argument. Um, I think the, the other important, uh, I think the distinction between commercial and state arts sector blurs at certain points, but at the very core of Davis' diagram, they, in Ireland anyway, it's unambiguously state sector. But that distinction, most of the employment is actually in the commercial sector, in Ireland, the vast majority is in the commercial sector. And the commercial sector, in my opinion, should be just as valued as the state sector. Um, commercial sector is like any other business sector, but I was surprised to hear at the lunch yesterday that there's so little um, assistance given by Enterprise Ireland to the commercial state sector. So that's something that could be looked at. So there's so much emphasis on the IT sector, and as David said already, a significant part of that is creative. Uh, and um, my conclusion then is in relation to the economic part of it is it's the commercial sector is a key part of industrial and tourism policy. And that's a message that needs to be repeated, but not at the expense of the other defining benefits of the arts. Thank you.